earliest memory of ahimsa i think for me ahimsa is love i remember when i was a young kid my one of my you know kindergarten friends had just gotten a motorbike so he was much older at the time and he's taking me around on his motorbike and he wants to show off how fast it goes and so he's like accelerating through all these speed bumps and all the potholes and i tell him i said bishma look you know i'm going to i'm going to throw up you know and he says no 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 you won't you know and he just keeps he keeps going and going i said really i'm going to throw up and he keeps going and i said uh, I, and then eventually i threw up and so here are these two teenage boys like looking very confused no mothers around what are you going to do and this one guy stops on the middle of the road um was this in america this is in india okay and he he stops he's on a bicycle he has a small bag mm-hmm. uh and he goes to a nearby tea, tea stall and he takes out a lemon mm-hmm. and he cuts the lemon in half mm-hmm. and he gives me the other half mm-hmm. and what was most striking about it is that he gave me this because i was throwing up so you know the citrus would make me feel good mm-hmm. uh but what was most striking about it is that he actually he didn't even introduce himself he didn't want anything in return he just gave this to me and he disappeared and here i am so many years later talking about him remembering him sending him love um uh, and i think this is the power of love mm-hmm. and at some later point at that point it didn't even occur to me that if you had if you had an extra lemon and you cut it in half you're you're not going to take the other half home unless that was the only lemon you had and you gave half of what you had um and so i just experienced repeated um moments with other people and then you question your narrative who do you want to be when you grow up and for me i think i want to be like that guy who is able to do what's needed mm. serve give with full heart mm. and disappear mm. um mm. and and that inspires me that, yes uh, and yet most people would not think of ahimsa in these terms because we think is uh, think of it as the yeah. opposite of violence yeah i i think we think of it as resistance we think of it as uh, you know fighting the status quo mm-hmm. uh which some of it of course in in very gross terms gandhi also said that 10% should can be satyagraha and 90% should be a constructive program mm-hmm. but actually even underneath both that 90 and 10% there's a movement of the 100% mm-hmm. uh which is the movement of deep interconnection mm-hmm. uh, and without that movement the 10% is hollow and the 90% also is hollow mm-hmm. just even the work of impact so mm-hmm. how do we start to what was the container mm. in which gandhi kept this spectrum yeah uh, and i think we often times we miss mm. uh tapping into that or even asking that question what mm. was it we we tend to think that gandhi created the movement mm. but i actually think that it's the movement that allows people like gandhi to manifest yes um yes. And, and so if that's you know so instead of saying who's the next gandhi i think the more pertinent question is uh, how do you build the field in which a gandhi can arise yeah what do you think are the main barriers to the kind of love that you experience that day because you've seen a lot of that in the world also i i th- i think the biggest barrier is transaction really so we say more so if we have multiple levels of reciprocity right so i give to you what are you giving back to me that is direct reciprocity and that is transaction i give to you you give to your neighbor your neighbor gives to you know another neighbor and what goes around comes around that is indirect reciprocity mm. but there is a third form which people like gandhi talk about which is because even with indirect reciprocity you have in circle and out circle mm. Mm. gandhi talked about infinite reciprocity he didn't talk about it in so many words but as soon whenever you are principal you are essentially saying i'm doing this for the principal and the ripple effect will be whether i sit on the shade uh, of those trees which i have planted or not that is not my concern mm-hmm. so you are just principled for the sake of principledness and i think that is infinite reciprocity mm-hmm. which is essentially the message of the gita as well right the means and the end right everything is you know the means are the end mm-hmm. and that's infinite reciprocity mm-hmm. but the opposite of that which is where our world is skewed towards is direct reciprocity which is transaction mm-hmm. and so that at its core as soon as you are saying what am i getting in return you are creating a divide and that divide over time will manifest in all kinds of different problems right and a sage i think there's a you know what i think there's a beautiful chinese master master hua said off by an inch in the beginning 
off by 10,000 miles at the end. Explain. So if you're off by, so most people notice things when they are very gross and manifest, right? Mm. Off by 10,000 miles at the end, the yes. twin towers are burning down. Right. But how do you catch that in the inches? Because it doesn't just happen overnight, right? It takes, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of field building for even for that kind of a field to manifest and that kind of negativity to happen. And what are the core building blocks of that? And so what inspires me most about Gandhi is actually that he worked outside these three M's. Mm. And he worked outside military, clearly. Mm. So he's outside power structures. He didn't, he never had political power. He never wanted it. He's outside market forces. Mm. Right? And he's outside this mass centralized media as well. So for me, he uses, he uses all of these. So he's using money also. Mm. He's, he's using government also, but he's composting these forces. Composting is not to deny that it has nutrients, mm. but you don't lead with it. He led with soul force. Mm. He led with this infinite reciprocity. He led with a non-transactionless, uh, value-oriented, uh, you know, principled action in every moment. Uh, so, and that you're saying is the core energy source of his non-violence. Yes. This infinite reciprocity. Yes. And, and and it's opposite. So you say, well, what are the sources of all these problems in the world? Why don't we? Why do we have so much violence? Mm -hmm. Is I think fundamentally transaction. Yeah. And when you do transaction, mm -hmm. you are uh, you are you power you create systems mm -hmm. that encourage accumulation. Mm -hmm. And so you have oh you have a lot of money, put it in the bank, we'll give you even more money. Mm -hmm. right? You are encouraging that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you encourage that kind of behavior, mm -hmm. uh, you are encouraging transactions. We have so many systems that encourage that. That divides us and that as an inch, that's off by an inch and then off by 10,000 miles at the end. Yeah. So can you summarize how the idea of creating service space was born very briefly? And I mean, if you had to tell people in, in a few minutes, what, how would you describe the service space network and ecosystem? I mean, I, I think it's an incubator mm -hmm. uh, of of different projects that work outside of, in the context of our conversation that work outside of these three ends. Yeah. So we don't lead with markets. We don't lead with government power. We don't lead with fame. We never pitch anything to the media ever. So none of we never fundraise. Yeah. Uh, so it, to me, I think it's more the process of it uh, that actually determines the quality of the of the fruits on that farm. Mm -hmm. um, so you can talk a lot about the different projects. We started by building websites for nonprofits, mm -hmm. uh, but and then we started by creating vertical portals. Like we said, there isn't enough good news in the world. Let's bring good in the world. Uh, so we have this portal called Good News. Then we said. Let's create a portal around kindness. So we created this viral, this game of smile card. You do a small act, you leave a smile card behind. Um, and then we started to do more offline things as well. We run a restaurant where people get to experience a little bit of infinite so reciprocity. The name of the restaurant? The name of the restaurant is called Karma Kitchen. So it's a pop-up restaurant mm -hmm. where everyone's check is read zero. Yeah. It's zero because someone before you has paid for you and you are trusted to pay forward for people after you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people think, oh, my God, like, who's going to tap into like this? You know, people are so transactional. Like, mm -hmm. where, why would you voluntarily pay for the person behind you? Um, and, of course, there's a lot of neuroscience that says that. And now there's a lot of research. So UC Berkeley came yeah. and studied this. Yeah. And uh, the title of their, uh, you know, research paper was paying more when paying for others. Mm -hmm. um, so so the restaurant is still going. It's not gone broke. because It's, people it's in do. 23 different places around the world. Yeah. And, and more than even the restaurant. So we're not trying to solve the hunger problem. No. The world, but we are yeah. actually trying to bring in this idea of shift from transaction to deep relationships and then to a field of trust yes. in which transformation can arise. Um, and, and so now, you know, there are, uh, there's an acupuncture clinic that experiments with this. There are yoga studios that operate in this way. Uh, there's like N number. There's a rickshaw in India that operates in this way. So there's N number of different projects. Mm -hmm. How do you see this ecosystem eventually affecting the larger picture, the larger reality? Is it a kind of osmosis process that you visualize? I don't visualize. Mm. So I don't know the answer to that. Mm. And if we study Gandhi, one of my friends uh, works in prisons mm. uh, in, in the US and he has a tattoo of 78 here. He says 78 people were living at the Gandhi ashram, living with the vows, cultivating their 
Swadharma mm. together mm. for 15 years mm. until Gandhi then said one day, let's go out and do the salt march and a few of them joined him. Mm. But we forget about those 15 years. We ask the question, what is the salt? Mm. We ask the question, who are those people that went there? But we forget that, and, and it wasn't 15 years and now we've hit the deadline. It was like for infinity. Mm. Maybe it takes three generations mm. and I'm part of that flow. Mm. So they're not asking the question of changing the world. They're actually mm. just holding themselves. They're changing themselves as they change themselves, as they dissolve themselves. Mm. They're merging mm. into a far greater flow of mm. emergence yeah. and they're trusting deeply in that flow. Yeah. So maybe my, you know, Gandhi is great and we all talk about Gandhi, but you know, you can talk about his mom and his dad and five generations before and all of that kind of ripples into who he is. You can talk about, you know, not just the, you can talk about the seeds, you can talk about the soil, you can talk about the climate mm -hmm. and you don't control all of these things. So I think we need to, for me, I don't know mm -hmm. and I don't need to know. Got it. Beautiful. It's, yeah. So let's put it another way that since you live in the US where there is so much everyday violence yeah. and school shootings, uh, in what ways uh, are you confronted by people who say nonviolence is unviable? It's unreal. How do you respond to those people? Oh, I mean, all the, all the time, everywhere. In, I mean, in, even when you transact with money, hmm. you are essentially saying this transaction is more important than the relationship underneath it. Hmm. Uh, or even having a relationship underneath it. Yeah, or even the potential. Like, you know, people don't... I, I was at a school uh, recently and I asked them, how many people think it's a scary world outside? Mm. Right? And 90% of the hands went up. Wow. And I said, you know, the world outside is saying the same thing about you. Like, why have we created this culture of extreme mistrust? Partly because that's the media cycles that, you know, that are feeding us these narratives. And you say, why are they just feeding us that narrative? Mm. So, yes, we all respond to fear. So that's going to get you attention and that's going to monetize what the work you're doing. But it's also going to, uh, you know, we have higher aspirations in us. Right? Mm. We have love in us and that can also be exercised. So mm. you can design for the seven uh, deadly sins, but are you also designing for the seven vital virtues? Mm. What are they? Just re uh, recite them again, please. Seven deadly sins? No, the seven. Okay, both. No, actually. no, I mean, I, it, no, no, the this seven is sort virtues. Of this Christian, uh, yeah. Faith. yeah, I mean, it's, it's not seven virtues. I'm saying it metaphorically. All right, okay. So, like the Buddha would say, there are ten paramis, whatever yes, your list yes. of virtues. Yes. But like, why are we not designing for compassion and kindness and generosity and trust? Yes. Right? Uh, and and these, these are virtues that we all know, that we all care for. No one says, I want to raise my kids to be not kind and not loving. I mean, everyone wants to be loving. We all want the love of our family members. So we understand that yeah. in, intrinsically. Yeah. And even neurochemically, we understand that. Nature has built us. Mm -hmm. We are wired to be kind. Yeah. Uh, but we don't do that. So we experience this. We experience this violence at so many levels. At, at the gross level, you see it. At the supermarket, you see it. In the systemic designs, you see it. But you also experience it in us, right? It's all there. Um, and so I think the question really is, how can we find the courage and the resiliency? Because this is not going to be a pill that you take and it's solved. So that's why it takes a lot of courage and resiliency to stick the course mm -hmm. and say, there is suffering, there is tension, there is division, there is polarity. Even in me, mm -hmm. I have different minds that are arising at different moments. Mm -hmm. And how do I not just say, okay, I'm just an angry person. You, no one person is just an angry person. An angry mind has arisen. And then you may have a generous mind that arises. You may have a compassionate mind that arises. Mm -hmm. So how do you start to create a meta narrative, which yeah. is able to hold all of these yeah. in a gentle way? Mm -hmm. And that I think is a very key thing. So it's not only are you confronted with this everywhere, in extreme gross violence, in subtle violence. You sit on the cushion and you know that you've got all kinds of problems inside you. You cannot even watch your breath for a minute or two or five or ten. So you're like, if that's the, if that's the state of our internal ecosystem, what is the best I can do on the outside? It's going to be scattered. It's going to be fragmented. It's going to ultimately lead to polarization. Mm. So how do we learn to sit with that? Mm. Um, this raises a very challenging question that are those who are not able to give that kind of time to actual meditation, yeah. um, are they then doomed to be victims of that polarization? Because, you know, I know that many of the practitioners of nonviolence, yeah. notably Thich Nhat Hanh, 
have said that if you have not been training yourself in a moment of crisis, it will be very difficult for you to opt for the non-violence, uh, to, to find the love within you. Yeah. So, but can you say something for the young people currently who yeah. are uh, in a situation of great conflict in India? Yeah. Um, that and they've suddenly they've, they've suddenly been found, uh, found themselves in the middle of that conflict situation. Yeah, they have no preparation, perhaps. Yeah. So what is what is that you can share that they, you know that they could do on the run? Yeah. Even without being able to sit in deep meditation. Yeah. I mean, I I, I think for me, whenever I'm confronted with some of these situations, and they are everywhere, mm -hmm. all all the time. I think all over the world, unfortunately. Um, I tend to I tend to reflect on what Gandhi said that how I for an eye leaves the whole world blind. So if I I don't want to react to the situation, but I do want to respond. And as you respond, so first I think the first journey is to go from reaction to response. And the second part is to go from responding to being skillful in your response. And as you're skillful, you, you learn to see a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. So if a person has this much vision, their skillfulness will have a limited scope. Mm -hmm. If your vision is this big, mm -hmm. then you will be able to be a lot more skillful because you have a lot more data points. So how do I then, and, and this is where, so I think we have to go from, we have to move from this immediate knee-jerk reaction, which is going to leave the whole world blind. Mm -hmm. To, okay, responding, mm -hmm. that this does need a response yes. and you do need to be, uh, sometimes you need to take a strong response. Mm. But then I think the skillfulness of that response, mm. Mm. Gandhi was incredibly skillful. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so how do we, Vinoba was incredibly skillful, Mandela was incredibly skillful, mm. uh, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, you can go down the list of your saints, they are not just compassionate, they are also skillful. Mm. But I think there is one stage beyond skillful, mm. which is humble. Mm. And we tend to think of humble from the frame of reaction, humility looks very weak. Mm. But actually what Vinoba said that if your intervention doesn't work, you try something, mm. you respond. Let's say you don't react, you respond and that response doesn't work. Which direction will your follow-up response be? Mm. And Vinoba provided an incredible clue and all the frontline heroes that I have seen in my life, and I know many of them, I've had the great privilege of knowing many of them, many of them are part of service phase. What they would do, and this is the difference between theoretical intellectual Gandhians and actually living Gandhians, they will say this intervention didn't work, I'm going to try a gentler intervention. And if the gentler intervention doesn't work, they'll say, I'm going to try an even gentler intervention and an even gentler. Mm. So Vinoba said to go from, you know, an intervention to gentler, to gentler, to gentler. Mm. Whereas if you've just read about Gandhi, if you've just had intellectualized from the frame of, you know, from, if your frame of reference is reaction mm. and the narratives of reaction, you will go from an intervention, oh, that didn't work, I, I need to have more coercion. Mm. So if more you, force. More force. More. I, I need more money. I need a bigger hammer. I need more power. Uh, I, I, I need a bigger microphone. Mm. And that's the thing. Because what happens when you go gentler mm. is that you are actually going, you are inviting yourself mm. and the world around you, mm. which are really mirrors of each other. You are inviting yourself to tap into an even deeper interconnection. Mm. And then operate from that space. Yeah. So you're saying at this level it didn't work, so I'm going to go one notch below. Mm. And as I go one notch below into a, the depths of our interconnection, and that takes work. Mm. As I do that, then my essence is more deeply connected with your essence. And even the smaller thing I do will have a greater impact. Mm. Mm. It's much easier to pick up a bigger microphone and try to yell louder than the other person. This is much harder because you now have to go from the gross to the subtle and subtle to the subtler. Mm. Beautiful. Say something about anger, because it is commonly believed, especially in a live uh, situation of conflict over injustice, yeah. that anger is a positive thing. That if you don't feel anger, how will you fight the injustice? Yeah. 
So in this frame that you've just beautifully articulated, yeah. could you say something about uh, how to, how do you see anger and uh, uh, how to process it? I, at one level, I think anger shows that you care. So I, I don't think it's like an anti-anger. In general, I, I don't like the idea to be anti-anything. I mean, if, if we, like permaculture, right? Weeds are there, you use the weeds, you have to be skillful around it. Maybe you put white clover so the weeds don't spread everywhere. But fundamentally, I think you don't want to alienate because then you're alienating parts of yourself mm -hmm. and that becomes problematic. Um, so I, I, I think anger shows that you care, but it's just not a skillful way. Mm. It's not the deepest skillfulness. Mm. Uh, Is that because in anger, when you're acting from anger, you're not fully in control of yourself? You, you are not fully seeing reality as it is. Mm. So you're seeing a very limited uh, data set. So you are, and when you, see, when you are in that space in you, you frame the other person to be in that space in them. So how, as we expand our frame, we are expanding the frame in which we are holding the outside world as well. And as we expand that frame, you realize that anger is one kind of a react. It's usually a reaction. Mm -hmm. But even if it's a response, you realize that it's not as skillful a response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so how do we start to give ourselves that choice that we do care? The Buddha cares as well. Buddha is not going to respond to Devdat with anger. They were just busy trying to assassinate him, you know. Um, and so, the yeah, Buddha also cares. He cares for Devdat, he cares for himself, he cares for, he cares for spreading Dharma. But he's not going to respond with anger because he has given himself the option to see a whole lot more. Mm. So you have to invest in that. Mm. And whatever that is, it doesn't need to be closed eye meditation, right? Mm. You don't need to go to the caves. Mm. But it's a way of just looking deeper mm. at ourselves and our interconnection. Yeah. In this context, I mean, kind of moving towards closing this conversation, uh, today families are divided. Yeah. But, I mean, from America to India, we are hearing um, reports of families being divided on some very fundamental yeah. issues of um, uh, hate and uh, who they think is part of their, uh, you know, who, is, who they approve of, who they disapprove of. So in that, how are you coping with that? And how are you helping? I know you must be helping many people to cope with this or find a way out of it. So how, how should people respond to this? You know, one, of, one of my friends has dedicated his life to this and he talks about this difference between uh, othering and belonging. Mm -hmm. So he says, we tend to other. And when you when you other and you say, I, this is me, you are the other. Mm -hmm. And he says, when you are othering, you build barriers. Mm -hmm. And how do we move from building barriers to building bridges? And it takes a, it, you to build a bridge to someone who is just like you, I think is a good start. But ultimately, to expand your frame to realize that even you are transient and you have so many different states and so many different beliefs. And when you see that, you realize that you are not just your body, you are not just your thoughts, you are not just your ideas and belief systems, you are not just your country. You are all of those things. Right? I am Indian, but I'm, maybe I'm universal first before I'm Indian, right? before I'm Indian, before I have this belief or that belief, before I have these mental states arising or that mental state. So I think anchoring in that universality and then finding skillfulness through our uniqueness. Mm. Mm. If, if we flip the order and unique goes before the universal, mm. I think we get into a lot of trouble. Mm. But if we lead with universal and allow our uniqueness to then uh, follow, then I think we have a really grand uh, communion and we're then able to build bridges. Mm, mm, mm. So if I'm a family member, if we are family members and you have a different political belief, that, like if my mom, my let's say my mom has a, a dramatically different political belief than me, but here's a woman that changed my diapers. Mm -hmm. right? Here's a woman that gave me unconditional love. Like she's much more than her political beliefs. Mm. She's much more than the transactions she might be engaged in. And so if I start to see her in that light, that you are much more than what you do. You are much more than what you accumulate. You are much more than what you think. Mm. Or say or say, certainly, or much more than what you say, then you are able to build a bridge. Mm. And when you build a bridge, mm. you go from othering mm. to belonging. Mm. 
Before we close, Nipun, give us a brief overview of the wide range of people who across the world, who are many of them in positions of great power, yeah. who are resonating very strongly with all that you have said here. I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to name names no, per se, name, but, but give us a general, say for in the corporate sector. Yeah, in, yeah. I, I'll give you an example without naming names. So I recently met with uh, six people that they, they came to, they wanted to visit me um, and over dinner. Um, and so they came and I realized that these six people control $200 billion dollars. Of, uh, of of funding of money of market whatever that I, I'm not even well versed I don't even know how to describe that right and they said look Nippon we know you're doing great work we want to alleviate suffering what should we do right? and that's why we're here we want to ask that question and we want to support that and I think the temptation is to then say okay that resource has a certain kind of power can you imagine right Gandhi talking to a military head and that military person says, you're doing great work. Let me send the militaries in India and help kick the British out. I mean, what is that? But we tend to put ourselves in positions where by the time you get to that table with these folks, you are thinking, oh, how can I grab all this money? Because, you know, okay, yeah, they, their heart, their journey is like less important than, you know, X amount of money that they have and the influence I can do. And we tend to cut corners in that way. But instead, so I look them in the eyes, I say, look, the answer is in your heart. So let's go out and do an act of kindness together. Let's go out and engage with the world in small acts. And then your heart will lead you where it needs to go. Don't look for my answers. My answer is my particular Swadharma, right? What is your Swadharma? And you have to find that answer. And I'm here to support you in that process, unconditionally, wanting nothing in return. And, I, and you would be amazed, like that by the end, I mean, of course, we were sharing lots of other stories and there was a great context, but at the end of the three hours, you know, in between, like two of them were in tears. And yeah, at the end of it, we didn't make a deal. They didn't have an immediate answer, but the inquiry went from, I have this and what can I do, to as saying, how can I actually go in and allow that answer to arise from within me? And that's sort of this repositioning of the universal first and then the uniqueness second. The uniqueness were the resources they had, but the universal is the love that their heart responds to. Mm -hmm. So if you lead with that universal and you say, I, and, and even in every conversation, if you lead with this kind of a universality, mm -hmm. people respond. They are moved to tears. They, you, you saw it even here. Right? We are here in this retreat with remarkably, remarkably influential people. And there's no agenda, there's no transaction. And you see these people, they're like, oh, on the Myers-Briggs test, you know, I was a thinking person. I never knew that I could cry so much. And like I've cried more in these last three days than ever before, but we don't have such spaces. And so even these leaders, especially for leaders, what we do is we end up boxing them into these narrow frames. And then they feel like what they have is really significant. But what you have is not nearly as significant as who you are becoming. Mm. And so if we double down on who you are becoming, mm. which is this connection with the universal, then I think the uniqueness, our unique sort of assets and resources, what we are trustees of, mm. follows. This is the difference between ownership and trustee, trusteeship mm. as well. Mm. Right? You would know more than anybody else. No, no, say it. Just, but I want you to just say, ex, ex, explain that. That if you lead with your uniqueness and you say, I have, I am this. Mm. Right? If you lead with the universal, then you say, look, I'm becoming, I'm changing. No, the trustee part. And these are the assets that I have. Mm. So I am bald and great, you know, I, that's, I'm a trustee of, uh, of a bald head. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, in the sense that this doesn't define me. Huh. Like how much I have in my bank doesn't define me. I'm not leading with that. I'm leading with, I want to build a deep relationship with you in the field of love, in the field of universal, universality. Mm -hmm. And then what will follow will be all these emergent manifestations mm -hmm. of our uniqueness is coming together and synergizing. Mm -hmm. But if we flip that order, mm -hmm. uh, you end up heading towards transaction. Uh, and, and I think people all over the world, I have not met, mm -hmm. I cannot say I've met really anyone. I mean, you have different degrees of resonance with this, surely. Mm -hmm. right? But I have not met people that will say, no, this is, love is a terrible idea. That, oh, this universal connection is a terrible idea. Oh, that there is this flow. Everyone knows there is this flow. Even if you're a sports fan, you have, you have heard so many sports players say, man, then I'm in the zone. 
So how can we design like the zone? We know in our cells of our body mm -hmm. that there is no transaction. There is this infinite reciprocity going on, indirect at least. Yeah. You look in nature and there is this, you know, birds don't have bank accounts, right? So there's so much intelligence to that. And I think uh, that's the invitation is yeah. for all of us to tap into that, yeah. find our own calling, you, you know, and work at the vibration that we are called to work at and, and try to transform ourselves and the world. Thank you very much.